This is going to be Revelation chapter 11. And it's going to be about being a great witness for the Lord. But verse 1 says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God in the altar, and them that worship therein. So a reed is a measuring stick, and we see that the temple of worship is coming back in the time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 2 says, But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given to the Gentiles in the holy, holy city, shall they tread under foot forty and two months. So the Antichrist is going to stand in this temple, claiming to be God. Then in Revelation 11.3, it says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Since these two witnesses are clothed in sackcloth, that means they are going to be in mourning. Genesis thirty-seven thirty-four says and talks about how Jacob rent his clothes and put on sackcloth when he was in mourning. These two witnesses are out on a mission to do the Lord's work. And this brings us to our first point. A great witness will mourn for the lost. James 4, 9 says, Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Ecclesiastes 7, 4, The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Ecclesiastes 7, 2, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. So for 1260 days, these two witnesses are going to mourn and weep while they preach. People on earth will be out for pleasure. Just like today, people are out for a good time. They want to be their own final authority. They will be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. People on earth will hate these two mourning witnesses who will convict them of their sins. And if you will get in your prayer closet and mourn and weep for someone else other than yourself, then you will get power. There is power in prayer if you pray using the words of God. That is where the power is at. A person needs to pray biblical prayers. We aren't going to get power if we ask for things that will fulfill the lusts of our flesh. Notice that Revelation 12.3 says God gives them power. So number two, a great witness for the Lord will have power. This also this is also what Jesus Christ did with the disciples. He gave them power. Luke ten nineteen says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. This will be a power that the Antichrist and his henchmen can counterfeit, but they won't have as much power. Compare it to Janus and Jambres, who withstood Moses. They had power, but it wasn't like the power of Moses. Simon the sorcerer had power, but he wanted Holy Ghost power that couldn't be bought with money. Acts 8.19 says, Giving me also, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. So Simon the sorcerer had power, but it isn't, didn't have power like the disciples had. Revelation 11.4 says, And these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks, standing before the God of the earth. Notice that the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, are prophesied all the way back in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah 4, 12 through 14. It calls them the two anointed ones. And Revelation eleven five says, If any men will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. This would definitely match Elijah. He could call down fire from heaven. Second Kings 1.10 says, And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. And number 16.35, Fire devoured the enemies of Moses. So this would also match Moses. The false prophet in the book of Revelation chapter 13 will also have this power to call down fire from heaven in the sight of men in Revelation 13.13. 13. So people are going to be amazed at what is taking place on earth. People are in awe of anyone who seems to have supernatural talent. 
This is why America's Got Talent is so popular with all the wicked magicians and sorcerers. That makes people want to see more and more things that are supernatural and men who are super men. But looking at our next point, point number three, a great witness for the Lord will speak words that burn the heart. Jeremiah said in chapter 20 and verse 9, But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. Luke twenty four thirty two, And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by thy way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? When a man gets his soul on fire with the words of God, then he will be able to burn the hearts of others with the truth when he opens the scriptures to them. And then Revelation eleven six says, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. The power to shut heaven is also a power that Elijah had. A lot of these superhero characters have the power of weather manipulation, and some men today are trying to control the weather with instruments. But God gives Elijah the real power to shut heaven. James 5.17 says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. So Elijah will bring another drought during the time of Jacob's trouble. Then when Jesus comes back, he brings a literal rain, a R-A-I-N rain, that will restore the world back to a Garden of Eden-like state. And this brings us to our next point. A great witness for the Lord will cause people to thirst after righteousness. The men in the time of Jacob's trouble will curse the two witnesses for stopping the rain. They will be thirsty, but not for righteousness. A great witness for the Lord will be so against sin and the abominations going on that his listeners will begin to hate the evil and thirst after that which is good. Jesus Christ is the living water, as the Bible says. It also calls him the Word. He is the living Word. A man who dwells in Jesus Christ and his statues is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. If you stay in fellowship with the Lord and thirst after righteousness, then you will see your besetting sins disappear over time. A great witness will witness with power that will dry up the sin in your eyes. He will make that sin look wicked to the point you will want to give it up and begin to thirst after righteousness. Revelation 11.6 says, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Who else do you know turned water to blood? That would be Moses. In Exodus 7.19, he did that very thing. He also brought plagues on the land of Egypt. This brings us to our next point. A great witness for the Lord can turn any conversation or situation into a giving of the gospel. These two witnesses can turn the water to blood. A great witness today can turn any situation into an opportunity to tell someone about the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you read the Bible enough and pray enough, you will begin to see God in everything you do. The smallest things will remind you of a Bible story. A common phrase will remind you of the common phrases in the Bible. Many times you don't have to come out and give the gospel at the beginning of a conversation. You can turn that conversation into a gospel presentation. So the same way Moses and Elijah turned the water to blood, you turn everything into a conversation about the blood of Jesus Christ. Revelation eleven seven says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Notice they don't die until they finish their testimony. Paul finished his course before he died, as it says in Second Timothy 4, 7. Before Jesus died, he said, It is finished. You won't die until God lets you die. You can cut your life short through sin, and God will let you die early. But if you will do the will of God, you will finish what he wants you to do before you go out of this world. Revelation eleven eight and 9 says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. 
So a great witness for the Lord will have enemies. Galatians 4.16 says, Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. The truth hurts. The Bible is bitter. A preacher can prick you in the heart like Simon Peter does in Acts 2. These witnesses are going to offend some people. If you stick up for the book and the gospel, then you are also going to offend some people. Matthew 13.57 says, And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. Now getting close to the end of the ministry of these two witnesses, we see that a great witness for the Lord will finish his course as they finish their testimony. And a great witness will die for the Lord Jesus Christ as they died. And there are Christians today who are dying just like these two witnesses will die. They are martyrs for Jesus Christ. Notice that they don't put their dead bodies in graves. It seems that they are mocking them and keeping their bodies in the street to rejoice over their death. In Revelation 11:10 it says, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Notice they make merry and send gifts. This seems to be around Christmas time. People from every nation, kindred, people, and tongue will celebrate Christmas as they see the dead bodies of God's people on the ground. Because these witnesses tormented them, the pure truth from the word of God will sting these people even harder than the locusts that came up out of the bottomless pit. True preachers of righteousness in the Bible are always hated. John the Baptist got his head cut off. They stoned Stephen. Great men of God have had terrible and horrible deaths and the contemporary Christian crowd the contemporary Christian crowd hates true Bible believers who teach the truth I believe there will be fake Christians in the time of Jacob's trouble pretending to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ they will call the two witnesses hate preachers and claim you have to reach people with only the love of Jesus just like they do today and when God's witnesses warn them about the mark of the beast, they will always say, Judge not, lest you be judged. Just like they do today when you try to tell them they're a sinner in need of salvation. They say, Judge not, lest you be judged. What these witnesses are going to do is tell them what the Bible already says and what God has already judged as wicked. These same fake Christians will be in agreement with the execution of real Bible preachers because they get in the way of a one-world religion, a religion of sensual music, watered-down fake preaching, a religion all about pleasure and money and fulfilling the desires of the flesh. Just like it is headed today in these mega churches, they got the sensual music, the fake preaching, it's all about money and fulfilling the desires of the flesh. Revelation 11:11. 11, 11. <clears throat> and after three days and in half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. So this is actually going to be seen by many, and they still won't believe. Just like when Abraham told the rich man in hell that his brethren wouldn't believe even though one rose from the dead. In Revelation 11:12, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in the cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And this brings us to our next point. A great witness knows there is a better day coming. These two witnesses will know the Bible. They will know their fate. Just like Joshua knew he wasn't going to be beat, the devil would have his hands full with two witnesses that have nothing to lose and know exactly when they are going to die and how. The same is true for you in a sense. You know in whom you have believed. You know that you're going to die and go to heaven. You don't know how you're going to die like these guys do. But you know that you're going to go to heaven when you die. Second Timothy 1.12 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. If you're saved and sealed into the day of redemption, then you know where you are going when you die. You know there is a mansion waiting on you. You know you are going to get to be with Jesus Christ, so you should witness for the Lord like you have nothing to lose. Matthew 10.39 says, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Being a faithful witness, 
might not be an easy thing, but it will pay off in eternity. The rapture of Elijah and Moses is a post-tribulation rapture that will involve other tribulation saints going up with them. Take note that all born-again believers in the body of Christ all went up in a pre-tribulation rapture. Now let's look at the evidence of the two witnesses being Moses and Elijah. Number one, both Moses and Elijah were on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus Christ, so if they came back then, they could easily come back again. They are both the last two men mentioned in the Old Testament in Malachi 4, 4 through 5. They were both taken to heaven from the same place. See Deuteronomy 34, 6 and 2 Kings chapter 2. Both of them fasted 40 days on Mount Sinai. Both destroyed men with fire. So there's a lot of uh, similarities there and a lot of things that would definitely lead us to believe that these are the two witnesses. If you don't want to believe that, then who cares? It's really not that big of a deal. Revelation 11:13 says, In the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake were slain of men ten thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. This earthquake will make the disaster movies look weak. Notice it says the remnant were affrighted. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A great witness for the Lord will fear God. He knows it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Revelation eleven fourteen and 15 says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. This shows us that this is the end of the tribulation time period because the kingdoms of this world have then become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Right now this isn't so. Right now Satan is the God of this world, but Jesus Christ will soon be king and establish his kingdom. He will rule in righteousness. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. If you are a faithful witness for the Lord, then you will rule and reign with Jesus Christ in the kingdom. Then Revelation eleven sixteen says, And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God. Notice that they aren't like the Benny Hinn crowd. They are falling on their face and not on their back. Revelation eleven seventeen says, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Notice the phrase, hast reigned. This implies that this took us further into the future, past the millennial reign right into eternity, because it says, hast reigned, past tense. Revelation 11.18 says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So it looks like we're at the great white throne now, past the millennial kingdom. At the great white throne judgment, the lost will be judged according to their works. This will be done to see how bad the lake of fire will be for them. The saints from the time of Jacob's trouble will receive rewards along with the Old Testament saints and prophets, I believe, at the great white throne. Because they weren't judged at the judgment seat of Christ, that is where born-again believers in Christ will be judged. At the judgment seat of Christ, not at the great white throne judgment. Revelation eleven nineteen says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of the testament, and there were lightnings and thunderings and, and an earthquake and great hail. So this is the end of Revelation chapter 11.